Thank you to everyone today for coming. Uh, I think we should start by acknowledging that we're on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, of the Cree, of the Dakota. We're on Treaty 1 territory in the homeland uh, of the Métis Nation. I think it's always important to make that acknowledgement. It's particularly important today to make that acknowledgement when we talk about mental health and addictions. And, and I think we should remember that, some of, once again, some of our Northern First Nations right now are facing a suicide crisis. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we want to offer what we think is a plan that will work for Indigenous communities, but also for all Manitobans. Um, fundamentally, our plan starts with committing 10% of the health care budget to mental health. Um, that's consistent uh, with what the National Mental Health Commission uh, called for in 2016. I should throw a quick shout out actually to Fran Schellenberg in the back there, who's formerly the ED of Mental Health and Spiritual Care in Manitoba. She consulted on this and was a real inspiration in pushing for what, what we all know is needed, I think what all Manitobans need, which is a better mental health system. We basically have gaps uh, and inadequate service wait times. There's a number of problems and we've seen repetitive governments underfund this. They haven't made it a priority. And it affects us all. More than one in four Manitobans deal with mental health or addiction. So each and every one of us probably knows someone who this impacts. Um, and yet, we underfund the system. Once again, we're, gonna, we're going to put in towards 10% of the budget. Uh, beyond that, we're gonna look to target uh, shortening some of the wait times. Some of the wait times are weeks, if not months, uh, for people to get the specialized counseling services that they need. So, uh, according to a 2018 provincial strategy document and some uh, freedom of information requests, we can see that it's about 168 days for women and 90 days for men. Uh, to get themselves on a wait list to see a psychiatrist. And there's 336 people on the wait list. 248 of them don't even have an appointment yet. They're on the wait list without even an appointment. They're waiting to get an appointment to stay on the wait list. So it's the wait list for the wait list. I could describe it that way, which is uh, incredibly inadequate. Uh, it's, it's just unacceptable. And we have to address the length of time that Manitobans are waiting for mental health and addictions. Uh, and we need to increase the options available for Manitobans. So we're really happy to put out a plan and a platform that's focused on mental health and addictions and includes several policies specifically geared towards addressing the mental health and the meth crisis. This includes establishing and enhancing harm reduction programs and increasing residential addiction treatment beds. Uh, they also plan to establish funding for clinical psychology and insured services under the provincial government and we want to increase the availability of telehealth and other technologies for rural and northern communities. Uh, we want to highlight that the federal government had $40 million on the table for home care and mental health. We would certainly take advantage of those funds right away. We went uh, dilly and dather and create fights with uh, everyone, including the federal government, rather than taking money, needed money that's there right now. Um, we hope that this platform will ignite hope for families. In communities that are impacted by the mental health problems and addictions, our platform commits to giving every Manitoba affected by these issues the supports they need to recover and then live meaningful lives. It commits to actions now that will commit to stronger, healthier, and more vibrant Manitobans. There's a few points, you know, just worth highlighting when we have in our background. You know, about 80% of people benefit from a uh, clinical, from a, psycho, a psychologist, uh, having treatment from a psychologist. Yet, once again, we already highlighted how long the waiting lists are. Um, I mentioned suicides, I mean, First Nations youth die by suicide about five to six times more often uh, than our non-Indigenous uh, population. So, uh, you know, this, this is something we have to highlight. This is something that impacts, unfortunately, our marginalized, our poor communities more often. Uh, people in lower income groups are almost three or four times more likely to experience mental health problems. So, you know, we have, honestly, a crisis on our hands. And we need a party that's going to deal with this, that's going to take this seriously. And sadly, uh, the Pallister government has, has failed to do that. I mean, uh, Minister Friesen, you know, was coming to saying, well, I teach my kids not to do drugs, and that's what we should do. But he fails to realize that the number of youth that have reported uh, utilizing injected drugs is nearly doubled. So maybe they're his kids, maybe they aren't, but it doesn't matter. They're all of Manitoba's kids. And that type of flippant attitude, I think, needs to stop. And I think it's, uh, you know, recently we've seen a poll that 
Manitobans by and large are agreed. Even, even many of PC supporters agree that this government has failed to deal with the meth crisis. They've, uh, and, and the opioid crisis and the addiction crisis we have generally, they, they basically fail to acknowledge it and they fail to pay attention to it. Um, just worth highlighting how much this means for Manitoba. In 2014, we asked the estimate about one and a half billion dollars was the cost of opioid and meth methamphetamine. But we've seen since 2014 skyrocketing use rates. So those costs, who knows, may have doubled. Um, it's hard to say, but they're certainly higher than they were in 2014. And then when we think about mental health and illness across Canada, it costs the Canadian economy 50 billion dollars a year. Um, not just in medical costs, and treatment costs, but it costs employers when they have uh, employees that call in on more sick days, so they literally lose productivity. People sometimes leave the workforce, so we, our tax base is harmed. I mean, we have to realize that, once again, investing in people is what we need to do. We need to focus on investing in Manitobans, in people, to make a better world. And that's fundamentally what this is all about. I don't know if anyone has any questions or any comments. When you talk about, you know, I guess enhancing harm reduction services, is that specifically supervised introduction sites? And if so, you know, can you speak to your party stance on, on those sites? Sure. It's not specifically to that. I, we do. We are in support of a supervised injection site. We think that's needed, but I think we generally have to, you know, once again, take a harm reduction approach, right? Minister Friesen's comments of "my kids don't do drugs" is your classic abstinence approach, and study after study has shown that that doesn't work. So another interesting model that that's been drawn to my attention um, is, is the work that St. Boniface Street Links is doing with more workouts. But one of the things they do is they have uh, a community bike bike patrol, riding around, talking to the people, getting to know the people. I mean, what we need to realize about harm reduction, it's about meeting people where they're at so we can gain their trust, or people that are supporting them can gain their trust, so that when they're ready to deal with their addiction, then they have someone they trust that can refer them to the right resources. Now, unfortunately, people may be waiting, you know, 168 days for women, 90 days for men, which honestly shows a, a real gender uh, bias in there as well. Um, so we've got to create better programs that are going to help streamline people in. But the reality is you have to meet people where they're at. And, and that's really, it, it's, a, it's a different type of approach. It, it starts with recognizing that some people out there are using drugs. I mean, that's just the truth. I mean, we can't just cover our eyes and pretend it doesn't exist. And then trying to figure out how we deal with them. Because, I mean, I've dealt with family members like many else that have dealt with addictions. And anyone understands it is you have to get to that person the second the second they finally have moved beyond denial and they're ready to accept their problems, you have to move fast. You can't just say, just think about it for three weeks. Because chances are they'll spiral back to that pattern of addiction. And so, you know, so it's, it's not just that, it's a whole general approach in terms of how you need to deal with addiction. When would you guys bump that percentage up to 10%? I guess, first of all, what is the current spending of that? I know you said you want to make it 10% on mental health, um, oh. total health care budget. What is that current number? And then when would you uh, bump it up? Sorry, we had the numbers there. I'm just trying to look for my numbers here. I apologize. Uh, First thing to know is it's a proportion, so you'd have to both increase the health budget and over time push to, to 10%. I think that could probably be done, honestly, three or four years. I know we had some numbers calculated, and I apologize. I should have had them in my head. If you want, I can... Uh, oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, we were looking at a rate initially about 1% annually. Sorry about that. So that would be about 64 to 65 million, just shy of 65 million a year. Uh, and we'd also have to look at increasing the overall health budget in that context as well, I would say. But we think that we need to do that and start pushing towards that. Right now, Manitoba only puts about 5% of its health budget into mental health, which is even less than the national average of around 7%. Um, so there's a lot of room to do that, and the faster we do that. Of course, just committing more funding is not everything. That's where we then have to target that funding to reducing wait, wait times, making psychologists more accessible, creating more treatment centers. I mean, uh, Morberg House is a great example, and I had a chance to tour a facility that the Conservatives have shut down that I'm told could be almost turnkey and create another one. Apparently we'd need about 30 to 40 long-term two-year beds that might deal somewhat with the demand for long-term meth treatment. I mean, one of the issues, I guess, with meth is that our current treatment programs are only 21 to 28 days, and the challenge is by the time you get out of 28 days, that's actually when the meth starts leaving your system and when your cravings are the strongest. So we need longer treatment programs, so that means looking at other models. But I think the Morberg House is a great model that could be emulated. There's others out there. I mean, the real answer that this government's failed to do is 
You sit down and you talk to the people that have the knowledge that have been working in the field and those with lived experience with mental health and addictions concerns. They are the ones that can tell you what's needed. So certainly, you know, that's going to be one of the first things I'm going to do if I'm put in the Premier's chair is to call people together and say, okay, hey, we've got a crisis. What do we need to do? We know we need to increase the funding, but how are we going to spend that funding in the most effective way? I don't pretend to have all of the answers. I think a better way is talking to those people that are working on the ground that do have the answers. You mentioned um, mental health resources uh, to First Nations kids. A lot of these kids that are in the list of suicide ideation are in the north where resources are very slim. So what would your party do to ensure that kids in remote northern communities have access to mental health resources? Well, sure. I mean, just like in Winnipeg, we need access to psychologists in, in our remote northern communities as well. In fact, perhaps almost even more than we do in Winnipeg in, in many regards. Um, beyond that, uh, I, we've also commented on trying to use the expand of telehealth and remote ways. I mean, it's even a challenge in some of those communities because the internet isn't even that uh, reliable. So we'd certainly have to look at that. But I certainly think both there's going to be a need to, um, to have more psychologists up there. I mean, I do know therapists and psychologists that do go up to northern communities, but they need more support. And one thing I'd also highlight is there does get to be challenges when you're dealing with with the 1966 Memorandum of Understanding that doesn't work with respect to First Nations, in, First Nations Indian Health Branch and the government of Manitoba, Manitoba Health, so you do end up having some jurisdictional issues to deal with, but I think we need to move on it. Certainly one thing I would be pushing on is, you know, we've got a useless climate change court case our Premier has put forward. I've suggested we actually really should push for a case under Section 36 of Canada's Constitution, which requires reasonably equitable access to services across all of Canada. And the reality is the way that we've structured things uh, between First Nation, between a lot of First Nations funding and the way the feds have underfunded not only healthcare but education and, and you know, <laughs> a number of initiatives. Uh, I would like to, like to see Manitoba initiate a court case on that basis, saying that you're not doing your job, you're not paying enough, and then move forward with the funding that we need on that and basically start a running tally of this is what the feds owe us if we win this case, this is what the feds owe us. Because it, it's sort of a Jordan's principle um, approach to dealing with, with uh, mental health, with the suicide crises. I mean, the end of the day, the reality is a lot of the time at some point this ends up coming to the Manitoba health system, so we really need to realize we're all in it together and we need to find better integrations. I don't pretend that's easy because of some of the constitutional wranglings, but I think it's needed. And sometimes it's important that leaders push forward on the hard files because, because people are dying. I mean, that's really what's going on here. We don't realize that. Just gears a little bit. Earlier this week, um, a number of Indigenous women and girls have called out all levels of government, all parties, for not implementing the 231 calls to justice. If your party gets uh, elected, what will you guys be doing to implement those calls to justice? Sure, we, we are committed to implementing the ones that apply to provincial government with respect anyway, and there's a number of them that stand out to me. One is a basic income, it was called for in there. Another one is restoring remote uh, rural bus service. So certainly without a doubt we'd be going through those recommendations and implementing them and I, you know, I think the Commission did great work and I think it's also important that they, they called out what is the reality of a systematic genocide in this country. I think we have to acknowledge that. So yes, we are committed to implementing them. I don't know I can get through all 231 recommendations uh, right now off the top of my head, but certainly we would go through them. And we do the same with the TRC recommendations. And I actually even think we should go back to the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry recommendations because I you know, put this out there, really looking for some master's student to do a study someday and compare the recommendations in the AGI, AGI in 1991 versus the TRC and now the MMIWG, and I think you'd find a lot of commonality in those recommendations. So it's not that we don't know what we need to do, it's that we failed to act uh, over decades. So just to confirm, though, you mentioned um, rural bus routes. Was that something, I mean, we have companies that have stepped in um, to take over that. Is that something that you would then partner with them? I think we're going to have to take a look at it. We'd actually like to partner with First Nations, utilizing the medical vans that they have. The problem with the companies that have set up right now, the, the prior model before Greyhound pulled up was a running routes model that required cross-subsidization, right? So in order to get the running routes from Winnipeg to Thompson, you also had to deal with Thompson to split, you know, Thompson to Tasquiac or Tom, Thompson to Gillum or whatever next leg might be. And, and ditto, if you wanted to do Winnipeg to Brandon, you were also going to have to do from Brandon to Wawanisa or from Brandon to Rivers or something like that, right? So 
that was the way we did it before. Unfortunately, the previous NDP government did hand some money over to Greyhound to keep them around, but at some point they decided to pull out. Um, and at that point, we had a, a bit of a crisis because the conservative approach has been allow has been to just allow the private market to fill in, but the private market isn't going to fill that last leg, right? The private market's going to fill Winnipeg to Thompson, it's going to fill Winnipeg to Brandon, but it's not necessarily going to fill the last leg. Now, one of the interesting challenges that Graham was having was that the First Nations, quite smartly and quite sagely, were utilizing their medical vans as an additional transportation revenue and was eating into Greyhound's market share. Good on them for doing that. I think the answer, and I did write a letter to Minister Ron Schuller at the time, former Minister of Transportation, urging him to convene a meeting of all First Nations to try to talk about this. Because the reality is, if your remote bus service goes to each First Nation, you are, generally speaking, serving every other community in Manitoba. If you want to get you want to get to Pine Creek Camperville, you're going through Dauphin. If you you know if you want to get to uh, Wayways to Capital, you're going through Rossburn. If you you know and, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, a, a lot of the time, if we make sure we have those services to those communities, it also means we're going to have service across Manitoba. So I think there's a lot of room for a cooperation cooperation that way. It's probably going to involve some public funding. I mean, we put public funding into mass transit. Uh, it's important that we realize that mass transportation is part of our road network. So often we think our road network is just the pavement, but no, we actually have to look at it broader uh, and realize um, that mass transportation is an integral part of the road network. It's a way that we can reduce decongestion. It's a way that we can make transportation accessible and affordable for people. Um, and particularly, you know, in, in the north and in our remote communities, it's, a lot of people rely on it for medical appointments, right? So it's a real issue.